Well, good afternoon and welcome to those attending this FS Club webinar. Uh, I'm dialing here uh, from London and we're here today on a fascinating topic, the new old, getting to grips with longevity. And our guest today is Simon Colhane, the Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. Uh, this is a bit of an unprecedented uh, webinar for us in that we've allowed Simon to do, to do an hour and that's because Simon has quite a few slides uh, about 127 uh, when I last counted, uh, but he promises to go through them uh, lickety split because there's so much to talk about. We thought that this would be important that we gave our special guests just that little bit of extra time. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors as yet, and it really is a privilege uh, to be able to introduce so many of these fascinating topics because our sponsors do allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. What more can you ask for? Now, demography, of course, is crucial. Um, we all want to be there at the end. Um, I think it was Woody Allen who said something along the lines of, we would like to be, uh, be known to be immortal for going out dying. So we're, we're looking at stuff like that. But it's interesting when you do look at the demographic prediction, uh, William Sheridan in, in uh, 1997, my apologies, wrote a fascinating book called The Fortune Sellers, where he debunked a whole range of prognostication, uh, weather, uh, science, technology forecasting. But the one that he gave the time of day to was in fact demography. It was the most predictable of the lot. And so when Simon's giving you these numbers here, uh, take them, uh, take them harder than you might say certain types of economic forecasts. Now, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from Simon. Simon, as I said, will be speaking a little bit longer than usual, uh, but there is a lot of material. Please, uh, three things, uh, do type your questions in to the GoToWebinar chat facility, and I will feed them into the uh, conversation at the end. Hopefully, we can call a few more minutes for that, uh, and Simon and I will, will be debating some of the, the points that you make. Secondly, uh, yes, this is being recorded, and the recording uh, and the slides will be available in approximately two working days, i.e. about uh, late, late Thursday afternoon. Um, and Simon will be getting all of the questions that you send in with your email attached to it, so he can reply to you directly or you can provide him with supplemental information because he has a lot of fascinating ground to cover. Um, so with that, I would suggest that we, we just get cracking. Simon, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, can you... Uh... Yes, let me just get the screen sorted. There we go. Hopefully you can now, uh, you can now see us. Yes. Okay, good. now, thank you very much everybody for attending, wherever you might be. Um, Simon Colhane from the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. You might be wondering, well, what on earth am I doing talking about demographics and longevity? Well, the reason is because really money needs to last longer. We're gonna run out and we are all getting so much older that we need to look after money. And as we provide the qualifications for people that look after your money, that's how we got interested in understanding just what is it going to like out there and how it is changing. Because this is, longevity is one of the mega trends and it, and it just creeps up ever so slowly, but consistency, a little bit like the proverbial tide and commute. Eventually it happens. I'm going to show you some facts and statistics and I suspect some of them you'll know and some of them you may not, but actually they provide a very compelling story about the pluses and minuses of us all living longer. So let's ask the first sort of question, really. How long do you think I have? And here's our first question. What do you think in 1960 was the average life expectancy of a male? And we have a little poll for us here. So we're going to ask you just to have a go, give four choices. Great. So Simon, the, the poll's up there now. Folks, you've got uh, about 15 seconds to answer it. 1960, average male life expectancy. 46, 51, 56, or 61. And do remember that's global. Uh, poll questions are coming, poll answers, my apologies, are coming in. Uh, as ever, Simon, uh, a very opinionated audience in FS Club, which I love. Uh, well over three quarters of the audience have voted, so we'll present the results. And the uh, results of the, well, 52% have gone for 56. So put us out of our misery. Okay, not bad, <coughs> not bad. 51. 51, I mean, that's a terrible number, isn't it, really? I suspect many of you may have reached that number by now. But in 1960, that was a life expectancy across the world. Now, if you went down to the UK, then most of the Western and developed world, the figures were much higher. 1960, 68, actually still a very low number. 
Uh, I was born in the 60s, in fact, in 1960s, so theoretically only a few years left. So Simon, you know, just, was... Simon, just a quick one here as a point of information. Um, yeah, if this were 1960, we'd be dead by now, is probably it. But uh, Colin Wilson would like to know, did you mean cohort or period life expectancy? Period life expectancy. So, life. so somebody who is born in 1960, their life expectancy at that point is for is 68 years. Great, thank you, sorry. So, and you. Uh, for women, and we'll see this throughout, women last longer, and we'll, we'll try and have a little go at working out why. Now, if we were to advance 30 years, actually things have uh, improved worldwide, that 51 has gone zooming up to 63. Phenomenal difference, really. 12 years in 30. And in the UK, we made some progress. So we're up to 73. And then in 2019, worldwide 70. So phenomenal change now. And in the UK, we're up just a little bit. So if we summarize that, you can see what a difference actually already we've got. I think it was like stock on the shelves, effectively. You know, the turnover of the stock, it had a shelf life of 51 days, as it were, or 51 years. Now it's got a shelf life of 70 years. So there is a lot more stock. There are a lot more people on the planet. And there you see with the women, uh, again, a significant advantage. Both cases, average uh, increase 37, 36%. And in the UK, it's not as dramatic because we started from a much higher base. Still not a bad increase. And actually what you found there for the men, or part of the reason why the men has had a bigger increase is because actually we moved away from some of the more dangerous occupations like mining and actually moved to other occupations uh, which are more office-based and therefore less risky. So industrial accidents have fallen considerably. But looking, at, <clears throat> looking around at life expectancy, you can get a, an idea of the drift there. Europe and the UK, fairly consistent, slow, gradual rise. Um, if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, in this particular case, I've just chosen Africa, we've got to fill this with 60 different uh, lines. But if you look at that in Africa, you can see the African elements have gone up from in the 40s up to only in the 60s. And so there is far more growth to come from some of these other countries, Africa particularly. And back in the UK, Here's an interesting statistic. One in five girls born today will live to 100, and nearly one in seven boys will do so too. And in fact, that statistic alone is actually a little bit of debate. That used to be one in three girls, but in the last couple of years, we may have gone backwards. Because projections um, previously were 24% of boys would, would, reach, uh, would reach 100, and 30% of girls. But, as we will discover, we have found that, um, well, there's plenty of evidence of why the growth in longevity is tailing off. And it's tailing off in every respect from many other different countries because of three common reasons. And one of them, the biggest ones, is obesity. And we're gonna see that in other countries as well. If you like, the, the problem of the, the affliction of the affluence, um, Obesity is, and diabetes are really taking off, and we see this particularly in the US and in Europe. And this, these figures here for children in the UK, in England schools, classified as overweight and obese, is a frightening, frightening statistic. 10 to 11 year olds, and other people will, can you hear me? Are you okay there, Peter? Yep, it's all fine here, Simon. All, right, all the pictures are frozen. Okay, but um, so you can see the obesity is a very big issue. And you go back 50, 50, 40 or 50 years, and some people will say that one of the big problems of obesity has been the reduction in the emphasis of sport in schools. So if you were playing rugby or swimming or doing athletics at school, that's what gets you started to continue doing that in your later life. And as sports pitches, many sports pitches were sold off or reduced and sport became, had less emphasis, active sport that is, lots of people got to watch it. That is also put down as to one of the many reasons we've got obesity. Uh, we could spend ages on that, but that obesity element is a big issue. And particularly as you find it, perversely, in the most deprived areas have growing elements of obesity. But 
uh, compared to, that shouldn't be 1990, so compared to 1900, not 1990, compared to 1900, there are four times as many people who live to the age of 70. And even if we look at just 1980, just take 1980, which is certainly we've all have been in around since 1980. Um, many of you might not have even got there, but 1980, three times as many people now live to the age of 90 in the UK than they did just 40 years ago. So we've seen some big changes. And as we looked at before, those life expectancies, and I've added a few different ones this time. Here we can look at India, Japan, Nigeria, Singapore, US, uh, and you can see them all growing, all reaching what looks like the sort of plateau of the average around about 80. And it's probably easier to see that actually in this chart here. I've just I've taken a few to give us an example. So there's the UK um, and there are quite interesting changes. China, take a good look at China. First one on the left here. China, 43.7 was the life expectancy in 1960. It's nearly 77 in 19, uh, 2019, a absolutely phenomenal jump. So you can see why China actually started to uh, worry about its one person uh, policy because it was already building in through longevity, virtually a doubling of its population. And then we can see also some of the implications in a minute of, of what they've done and how it might not have been quite so successful. But India and China, you can see them both in the 40s in 1960 and now significantly up. India noticeably less than China. And on the other side, you've got um, a vote longevity. You've got um, Japan and Singapore. Now, Singapore will tell me these statistics are out of date. It's true. Uh, 2019, that's the last year we can get everybody. But Singapore proudly announced about sort of a year ago that they had beaten Japan and they were now 84.6. But Singapore, as we will see in a minute, has its own problems. So enormous changes. And I think you can say what, one of the questions is, can we not all get to be the best here? Can we not all expect to get up to 84, 85? What's holding us back for that? And if so, what are the implications of that? In some places like Nigeria, particularly Nigeria, just look at what that could do to Nigeria if it could get up to 83, 84 years. And we'll have a look at all those things in a moment. But I want to show, I want to start by looking at some population pyramids. And here are just three typical shapes. And you've got essentially um, an ex what they call an expansive shape on the left, which let's call that the triangle. Then we've got a constrictive, which really is a sort of the spinning top, the reverse of a spinning top. And the stationary is almost like, uh, I regard that as a rectangle with a triangle on top. So, if you start with a rectangle with a triangle on top, that's pretty much what you've got for the UK, which basically says pretty much stable, uh, the odd little wiggle every now and then, but that's pretty much stable traditional triangle as you all peter off. Now let's take a look at some other ones here. Malaysia. I'm just picking some of these countries at the moment to see at random. So quite interesting. What an incredibly big tail, big top that's got. That triangle is really goes quite quite deep down. Um, so they start to lose people quite early on, which means it looks like it started as an expansionist policy. And then it then starts to constrict. Um, and we start to see that, and that coincides with economic growth. So as countries get to uh, grow economically, their whole um, model changes. And instead of effectively having people, having, people having children, to work on the farm, they moved to being working in the city, uh, less children required, and populations dropped dramatically. And you can see perhaps the best or worst example is Singapore. That is a crazy shape. I mean, that is a very odd shape indeed. So Singapore were expansionist, expansionist, and then possibly one of the most successful uh, countries in the world, uh, from an economic point of view, certainly. Um, they really got uh, the economics, their GDP is uh, extremely high, top five. And now you've got, and you have got essentially very little population growth. And, and Singapore is in such, uh, has such a problem now, that although it's got one of the um, oldest longevities in terms of their citizens, there are fewer and fewer of the citizens. And indeed they're going to actually have to pay their citizens to have a baby. 
and they're going to pay them um, uh, some some uh, about fourteen thousand dollars for the first one, and for the second uh, you're going to get twenty two thousand, and for the fifth you can have five children, you get twenty eight thousand dollars direct to the person. Now, interestingly, about a year and a half ago, I uh, I met with uh, a lady who happened to be in London, who happened to be a senator in Sydney. And I said to her, she was telling me about all the things they're doing to promote fertility. And at that stage, they had not targeted payments to the mothers. And I said to her, why have you not done that? And she said to me with a very straight face, we don't want the wrong people to breed. And that's a frightening statement. Uh, they've clearly had second thoughts. They now need everyone in Singapore to breed. They are running out of people. And we will look in a minute at what uh, the effect is on that. But back to our pyramids. The classic one that we all hear about is Japan. And we talk about Japan, we never really know that Japan is shrinking. And it certainly is shrinking. And this is the problem for Japan is that you can see what is going to happen for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. There's really not a lot you can do about it. You're not going to change things too dramatically. It takes a very long time to change demographics. And Japan, we see, starts out with uh, 5.8 workers to one in 1919. In fact, if you went back to 1970, you'd find there are 11.1 workers um, to one. And then 3.9, and now it's by 2025, only 2.1 workers. And here, workers are being defined as those between 16 and 64, um, divided by those over 65 plus. Uh, and Japan, Japan has a big problem, and particularly for women. Uh, part of the Japanese culture, uh, the role of the woman is definitely subservient, and in fact, it's difficult for them to, to earn. Um, and so they don't build up much saving themselves. And when their husband dies, their pension is modest, and they're going to live a very long time. So, uh, in fact, they've just uh, announced some some changes to their uh, payment ratios to give um, give women an extra push. Um, but essentially, it's a frightening position where in Japan, more adult diapers are sold than the infant one. The population has reached the stage where it is very aged. And as a result, only a few months ago, in August, um, the civil servants, public sector, were given time off to boost fertility. You know, there are active steps here to encourage people to have sex and procreate. Um, a big problem for some of those countries. Uh, and as I say, Japan may be the best known, but as we'll see in a minute, um, when you run out of people like Singapore, you have got a big strategic problem. <coughs> Let's move to India and China. India is a marvelous picture. There is expansionist for you, writ large, except for right at the end. Last 10 years, India's got economic growth kicking off and family size is starting to shrink, following the same pattern. In China, you've got a, a difference here. So you had expansionists, then we start the famous one, one family. Now the one child per family lasted for ooh, 30 years, and then it moved to actually two children per family, which has been up for about seven or eight years. A recent announcement was to have three children. And I think that no one's going to have three children. And the reason they've gone to three children is because very few people are having two children. But if you say there are three children, and people will then say, well, it's okay to have two children. I'll take the middle option. So I think there's a bit of psychological nudging going on there. But they need to. Because here's another question. Who will have more people in 2023? India or China? What do you think? Okay, so we're here with uh, this one. And again, everybody's warmed up now, Simon. So over three quarters have voted and put us out of our misery. Uh, let's see I the results. I can't see the results. What do you, what do you say? Results are 94% will be Indian and 6% uh, Chinese. So. Well, you're all completely correct, of course, because um, as we look, and we, a, quick, a quick look is, let's take a look at the statistics. Uh, China, 1.6 fertility per woman, 2.4 for India, bingo. You're absolutely right. Uh, I think India will cross at least this uh, in this year and will continue 
the Indian, the, the green of India will continue to make quite a difference. So India will rapidly become the, the biggest uh, country on the planet. Um, <coughs> and uh, China will, will be second in that terms and for some time. But back to the UK, a little look through the last few years of, of, of the UK. We can see the pictures here as you see a little bulge coming through. Uh, that was a, the baby boomers, pretty flat here. But the population number pretty static and you can see that the diagram is bog standard rectangle with a triangle on top really the uk is actually getting its its people from migration and you can look about population really like sailing so in sailing if you've got the wind behind you you're going in one direction and then you have the current perhaps let's say the current against you you go in another direction if you've got a strong enough wind and you can tack in a good enough sailor, you'll go in, you'll go forwards in one direction of travel. Um, and in terms of population dynamics, you've got births offset by deaths, but you've also got two other factors. Your population has a longevity factor. Uh, it's a plus, sometimes it's a major plus, others it's a little trickle, and it's also got immigration or migration on the other side against the death rate. So you've got those sort of five forces balancing and that sort of tells you which direction you're going to go into and I've just taken three countries to just have a look at so let's take the Philippines so Philippines population about 100 million now uh, but their birth rate 20.2 very very high uh, one of the highest around they've got a longevity kick as well every year it's worth effectively 0.3 of a year so uh, that's quite helpful against that they sell people, they, sorry, they don't sell people, people leave and go and work abroad uh, and send remittances back to their families. 10% of Philippines GDP is from remittances from foreign workers. So essentially they're a net exporter of people and they also have a pretty low death rate. So they are growing at a phenomenal rate. Theirs will be a classic triangle. Uh, and their growth of 1.35% means an extra million, million and a half people are coming to in net coming into that crowded country and uh, and of course they can't cope with that and no one can cope with that sort of numbers coming in infrastructure desperately needs attention in the uk we in the uk are about neutral the births and deaths are not far off a very modest growth in longevity um and but we've got a bit of migration and that is actually what's giving us a half a percent rise uh, we're actually pretty much in equilibrium on births and deaths and, and getting pretty close to it expected to actually get very close to it japan as we were looking at earlier that's the boat going the other way the death rate is higher than the birth rate modest longevity although they do have uh they they started from quite a low base actually and they've got no migration i mean nobody comes in or comes out of japan actually it's virtually zero so uh, a declining population though because simply the death rate is um, outliving or greater than the births and it's worth having a look at the death rate you know what do people die of and what do, can we learn from that so globally it's coronary heart disease is the biggest killer of people followed by stroke and then lung disease you noticed down here that cancers lung cancers start to come in but they're only sort of fifth or sixth markedly different than heart disease and this is of course the global picture if you take locally we can do this for every country but we're just going to look at um, just the uk today um so the uk picture so you've got two numbers here well you've got the position where it is so the first thing is coronary heart disease is the biggest killer and the number 170 means out of a world ranking of about 200 or so the countries depending how you define it but about 200 countries we are 170 in other words the people that get global heart disease actually is relatively few compared to the rest of the world uh, but other numbers we are much higher alzheimer's dementia, disease of the brain, disease of the age. I mean, Alzheimer's and dementia is essentially an old person disease. The countries where you've got greater longevity are gonna have a much higher number of people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And then you start your cancers and we've got lung cancer in there and breast cancer and prostate cancer and colon cancer. 
add up all the cancers, they're miles ahead from the, uh, the coronary heart disease. So cancer as a group is a bigger killer on the UK, but not if not uh, if you take them in individual subject areas. So quite significant, and we can see heart disease being globally uh, as a key one, but I'll, the biggest element for here is that, to pick up is the Alzheimer's and dementia, which is definitely a developed longevity a country. Um, and if we if we look at dementia cases, uh, there was a report out actually only this week about cases of dementia. It's going to be tripling, and that is not really a surprise um, because we are all getting older. All the countries are getting older, and I don't find it a surprise that we're seeing in East Asia and others they're predicting huge increases because that's a proxy for where we see larger numbers of older people. So places like Qatar, which is the headline in the, in the Times, and this is for literally a week ago, Qatar up 20 times. No, I'm not surprised. You know, for those of you that uh, may know something about Qatar, you'll know that it's a very small uh, but very powerful uh, oil state. Actually, it has no, no oil. It's got uh, LPG and methane, and it sells that, uh, and has become in the last 20, 25 years, as we know from its airline and from what it actually buys, most of London and the Shard and everything else, it actually is now a major player. Its people are incredibly affluent, uh, and with the affluence, they are living longer, good facilities. Uh, there's also now obesity, but they're also now living a, a lot longer. So that's why they're up 20 times. Um, but one other interesting fact is that COVID, uh, and we'll have a quick look at COVID, COVID has actually taken a toll on dementia sufferers. And perversely, it has actually, because it has attacked and Dementia sufferers, particularly, have been killed by it. Actually, we won't have as many people dying of dementia because the COVID has already taken a large chunk of them. But other factors that cause dementia are air pollution, depression, isolation. Uh, but the real, the real numbers, as you can see, are, are obesity, diabetes, um, smoking. And we'll, I mean, smoking appears time and time again, actually. As a major cause of death around the world. Let's take a look at our COVID for a minute. We'd like we're going to have a little diversion into COVID. COVID is a uh, a with all its variants, all its 13, 14 variants, it is a disease that attacks the aged uh, and it also attacks the males. The the rate in, in males to females is two to one and there is we have enough information now based on the original and the alpha variant. The alpha one, if you remember, actually was one in the UK, but the original Wuhan and alpha, there's enough data to have, if you like, age specific mortality rates. So if you take um, every country, or in my case, 50 countries, and you multiply each of the populations by the specific death rate for that age cohort, you get these sort of numbers. So if you had no intervention, no vaccination, you'd expect that these countries would suffer this sort of loss. So you'd expect to see 11 million people die in the US and in Japan, 7 million and the world 171. And that's, you know, some people get very alarmed about that, but that's not a very helpful statistic. I mean, you've got the UK at 2.7. Um, perhaps another way of looking at it is to say, what is the expected mortality rate per 10,000 people? And here you get a slightly different picture. And here it's very clear. So if you look at the, uh, the people in the, in the green, so Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, initially, when you say, look, uh, 1.7 million people might die in Nigeria, but actually only 88 people uh, per 10,000, one of the lowest mortalities, and Africa itself, one of the lowest. On the other side, Japan, uh, 7 million and one of the highest of 584 expected uh, per 10,000 if you did nothing. And of course, the reason for that is because that is a proxy for the youthfulness of each country. Because the uh, COVID attacks the age and has a pretty linear um, recording down for actually it's exponential decay for each age group, you've got essentially a measure for how young is that country. 
So you can see actually Africa is pretty young and actually so too is the Philippines. Um, but some of the older established countries, the European countries, their age groups are actually much older than the rest. And that may be a harbinger of problems to come. And if you look around from the 6th of Jan, here's, the, here's COVID hitting. Where are the cases? And you can see a swathe of bright colours or white colours, and that's in Africa. Apart from South Africa, most of Africa has really not got hit too badly by COVID. Uh, partly, we, of course, we don't know whether they've got the cases, but the death rate you will note. And actually, the death rate uh, graph is very similar to this for the cases. So essentially, COVID is a, uh, a young, uh, a young R example from COVID, uh, the older people get attacked by it. And this graph here on the chart just shows you what effect it is having on male life expectancy. You can see that actually in just a year, we've lost a few years. COVID is actually moving everything back um, in the US. The life expectancy at birth has now fallen by 2.2 years, a phenomenal setback. So the prolonged COVID uh, disease is actually having a, a big effect. But let's get back to business. What have, what's improving? Why, are we, why have we gone to live so longer? Well, bluntly, it's better diet, better diet, better sanitations, less smoking, better working conditions, better diet, and better medical advances. You could probably put those into the top three. Better medical, exam, um, better medical advances, better diet, and less tobacco. Uh, those are really key. And in terms of women and men, well, actually, very interesting. Smoking is one of the biggest differences between women and men. There's some debate, actually, as to how many people smoke in the UK. Uh, the ONS says it's 15%. Uh, the World Bank says it's a lot higher. Uh, only yesterday I checked this, and the ONS is now saying it's dropped to 14.5% for, for males. Uh, in comparison to a number of other countries where it's over 40%. But if you look at the percentage of women who smoke regularly by gender, in nearly every case, it's far more men than women. Uh, women, frankly, are smarter than men. And you see that again in East Africa, particularly, for example. Um, it's something men do, women don't. Um, looking at a little bit further, uh, a couple of other statistics jumped out earlier on. Uh, one of them about gender balance. You know, why haven't we got a constant gender balance across the countries? And there are two that stand out. And let's go back to those two pyramids, India and China. And they should be equal or very nearly equal. If we flip the blue over the red, we get a little excess. And that excess is not just chance. And if we went to China and we flip the blue over the red, we get a large gap. And in fact, if we go to neonatal girls, in most cases, the, the girls survive better than the boys, but not in India or China the boys survive better than the girls. And you are left with the unpleasant, but nevertheless factual uh, evidence of selective abortion and infanticide, female infanticide. And it's probably 30 million plus in India and China. 30 million uh, girls in India and China over the last few years. That is the entire population, entire female population of the UK. So you are seeing uh, some quite uh, hideous results uh, and that is because males are prized higher and of course from an economic perspective it's quite interesting to look at it from an economic perspective to look at one point here what does it do to um to the 15 to 24 year old group when people are trying to find a mate uh, and in fact you'll find that there's a great shortage of, of females in india and china and part of the problem for that well, part of the economic consequences is that dowries which are of course banned but exist all the same the price of a dowry has reduced because women are actually quite valuable. And you're seeing lots of uh, brides being imported, particularly Thai brides to India. Um, now, let's expand our horizon a bit and look a little further. 2020, uh, I'd like to go forward to 2100 hours, or even year 2100, and ask you who is going to be the third most populous country along with. China and India. So here's a poll. What's the third most popular country? India and China are two. Who's going to be third? Okay, folks, so we've got Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, Pakistan, 
Um, everybody's been getting the practice in, Simon. It's always good that way. I'm um, just looking here at the answers. 65% uh, have voted. Leave it out for just a couple more seconds. Give you a chance to have a glass of water. Well over 85% have voted, and we'll show you the results. And uh, this is not as clear cut as the last time. So 44% for Nigeria, 28% for Indonesia, 22% for Brazil, and 6% for Pakistan. Again, okay, Simon. Well, Thank you. I'm going to keep you in suspense for a little bit longer um, oh. as, we progress, as we progress down there and uh, see whether we can work out in a second which one it is. But you're, um, I think the persons, <coughs> the ones who went with them with um, the, the majority might be correct. Let's have a look. Um, let's just take a look at a couple of thoughts here. Some of these countries uh, here in this group have got very high replacement and high fertility countries where the fertility rate per women is very high. And here you can see Nigeria, very high, 5.39. All those countries, in, uh, in particularly in Africa, are growing uh, significantly. And although they lose people in migration, their populations are increasing very noticeably. They have a population growing at 2.5%, 2.6%, phenomenal, um, and will lead to quite significant changes. Because there are some challenges. Um, for higher fertility countries. Infrastructure always lags economic growth. Always, always, always. So people grow, they clog up the city, they clog up the arteries, there aren't enough schools, there aren't enough hospitals, there aren't enough transport. Eventually, the money is raised, and of course, people consume resources before they become useful to, to produce resources. So a country that's very young has a lot of needs and not much money. That's why it needs a lot of development aid. Um, so you generally find low income levels, you get low poverty, uh, and you find that uh, that women particularly have children much younger uh, and almost on permanent mothers. So they move go abroad. But on the other hand, it does provide some power and there are some pluses. If you're a strong man or a strong leader, actually size is important. Um, if you have a large population, you are more taken more seriously. You will have a larger army and you will be able to dominate your neighbor. Uh, and that can and does or will generally lead to economic power. So there can be a strategy that says I am going to have a lot of people and I am then going to take over and provide greater resources. Um, but it does, uh, it does take a long time to do that. And we will see that in 2100, the world's population is going to fall, but Africa is going to rise significantly. Africa's population is going to surge. As we saw about those countries that have such a high fertility level, they're going to take seven of the top 20 spots. And if we were to, um, to look at that, yes, Nigeria, I should say, will actually be one of the biggest. If you look at that last slide, look at that figure for Nigeria, right at the bottom here, Nigeria, 790 million, a phenomenal growth. So Nigeria is going to be the most, it's going to actually not be the third, it's going to be the second. So if we look at those in two ways, first of all, there's the individual population growth change. So you can see Nigeria and others. And then let's take a look at the other side of the coin, the low fertility countries. And I alluded to the fact that Singapore has got a problem, a monster problem. If you're only having 1.14 fertility rate per woman, you're going to run out of people pretty damn quick. And uh, the only way you're going to get that is to actually import people, migration. But you can't be too clever. Anybody who's under consistently under two is having a problem. So you're dipping into your stocks. And so you can see down Europe, most of Europe is way below two. Um, and uh, 1.73, 1.68 for the UK, you know, that will lead to a reduction. And if we were to um, look at how that's going to change, um, we can see that actually the current global fertility rate is expected to drop from 2.37 to 1.66 by 2100, not 2020. And that's going to mean that for Europe, you're going to see a great drop in uh, population. Now these figures, by the way, these figures are taken from the University of Washington Institute of Health Metrics and e Evolution and were validated by The Lancet and peer reviewed by Harvard. So 
they have got credibility. And it's caused a great fuss when they came out in June last year, July last year, uh, because it actually shows quite a dramatic change in the world order. Uh, Singapore survives by uh, migration. But Europe, look at this, halving. China, halving. And that new world order I talked about, it changes dramatically. You want to be looking here at China, then India, and then we've got Nigeria. India, Nigeria, China. There is your new world order. The US comes on in fourth, and Pakistan is uh, pretty close to the US. Indonesia doesn't actually make good on its promise. It's Nigeria. So the new world population, the top three, India, Nigeria, and China. Significant difference to how it's going to turn out. And you can see it starts to change quite dramatically. Uh, and you see the gap also between um, India and China. Uh, we have already, we've already looked at the, uh, the Indian population overtaking China, and it, and it will keep doing so for, I can confidently say, our lifetime. So here's the nub. How are you going to finance living longer? What's the savings rate? Well, it varies, actually. I mean, Singapore, phenomenal, the savings rate. Um, but that's partly because they've got no children to spend it on. In terms of the UK, we have a reasonable savings rate. And I suspect when we look at 2021, we will see that savings rate rise even more. COVID has actually made us a nation of savings. Um, but the population, the elder population of those over 65 has grown significantly. And that's a group that's going to have to live on its money for longer. In the UK, we see that zooming up. Um, the population has grown significantly to nearly 20% nearly of the population will be over 65. A significant jump, a significant increase and consistently. We talked about dependency ratios briefly when we looked at Japan. I mean, worldwide dependency ratios, the number of People aged 15 and 64 over 65, I is propping, propping up and providing uh, income and resources to look after these people. Not, uh, I started 11.6, 11.3, worldwide dropped to seven. And we looked at Japan, but look at the UK. The UK's dependency ratio has dropped as well. Now, quite interesting, if you actually change the dependency ratio and say, well, what happens if we were to go to 67 and a half. So we supposing we said that's your pension age, because 65 used to be taken as a pension age. Then that dependency ratio moves to uh, from 3.41 to 4.1, which only takes us back to 2010. Then what happens if we said, okay, so what have we got to do to get it back to say five? The answer is we've got to go to 70. So 65 is, is sorry, 70 is the new 65. Uh, so in terms of actually bringing us back to be dependency, uh, we need people to really not take their pensions to 70 rather than 65. And indeed, we've already got our pensions changed to 67, 66 uh, now, and it's going to change to 67, and the most certainly will rise to 68. And that's because we are all living longer, and we're now all working longer and able to work longer. So you can see that the population employed by age group has continued to increase. The line that's gone down is the line age 16 to 17. So you're actually, people have been getting into school and getting into work very quickly. And um, what's, that used to, what's that done to the pension side of life? Well, it used to be that you saved a bit, your employer saved a bit, and after 40 years, you worked for about three or, you worked for 40 years and you had about only three or four left. And bingo, you got 70% of your income, and you were uh, okay for your massive three years. Now it's eight years and already we can't make the 70% income and the savings rates are now having to increase significantly. And in the future, what's it gonna be? Well, we're gonna be working 45 years minimum, 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 if you want to have, and you will have 15 years of retirement. Money needs to last longer. And COVID has actually polarized things. If you're under 70, you're going to stick around and do a bit more work. If you're over 70, actually, you're going to call it a day. And the problem here is um, that really we need people to understand finance and educate people who, live who are living longer to how to manage their money to make it last long. Uh, an actual fact, not very many people know about pensions, not many people know about investments. 
and this survey that was done by LV was talking about people who, uh, what percentage of people understood about the options of retirement and when should they start looking at them. And basically, people don't really get excited about retirement until a few years before they're thinking about it. And that, of course, is the big problem because it's usually a bit too late then. So, you know, where we are coming from, uh, from the Institute, is that we believe that uh, you need guidance from people who have knowledge, skills, and profession, and uh, knowledge, skills, and behavior. And that's actually what we, what we provide with our qualifications in education. So key messages then, we're all living a lot longer. It is a big mega trend. The age mix is changing. COVID is actually already having a big impact and will probably have a bit of an, another impact further on after, after year two. Um, if you live around, you're here in the year 2100, actually it's India, Nigeria and Africa that are going to be the big news stories. Africa's gonna dominate. Um, but we will, and we will are working much longer as we live longer. Money needs to last long. Thank you very much. Simon, that was a tour de force. Well done and absolutely spot on time. So thank you. Uh, we've got a number of questions and comments. Um, and I'm going to read a longish comment just to give you a chance to uh, grab a small glass of water. It's from Steve Wells, and he's kind of riffing off what you've been saying. He says, one thing we are likely to find is that through lifestyle changes and pharmaceutical inventions, as the population ages, it will do so with greater economic activity. Uh, the issue is uh, that we've got good at keeping people alive, but not living economically productive lives, as you said. Uh, other dynamics, uh, rate at which jobs are automated. Uh, and if, if aging were ever to be considered a treatable condition rather than an inevitability, the social and economic implications would be very different to those we might see from extrapolating trends. Uh, he therefore uh, puts in a plea for more scenario planning uh, as well as extrapolation. But uh, to give you some uh, some short, quick questions to get going, uh, we'll start locally if, if we could, I think uh, really with the UK. Uh, two questions that you might just comment on. Uh, you mentioned, Michael Jury is interested, have the new UK immigration policies affected your figures as yet or do you expect them to? And Abel Abo is curious, he'd like to know the impact if you have it across the nations in the UK, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Any quick um, response? Well, the quick response is, is the, migra the migration is a really interesting, uh, the, the recent surge, if you're referring to the recent surge in the last two years, it's too early for that, but, it, 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 but we're virtually in balance now, actually. So um, the migration is likely to have increased it, but then we actually did lose quite a lot of people as a result of the Brexit who didn't come back. So it's a bit muddled to get a clear picture of what the net effect is, but we are questionably uh, migration for, on a permanent basis. We, we certainly will expect to see that fall to some of the figures. I'm afraid I do, I don't know the figures for um, England, Scotland, and Wales. It will be interesting. Uh, there's great data. The RNS is a great supply of data, actually. Uh, some very nice tables. So I encourage you to, you can get lost for hours. If, if you go into the ONS online library and you like stats, it's all there. Well, I must say, I, I personally was quite surprised in your presentation at the immediate uh, drop in uh, of one to two years across the, the world uh, due, to, due to COVID, uh, which, which is, I think, an important. And of course, uh, Colin Wilson comes back and points out using period life expectancy hugely exaggerates the impact of COVID because it effectively assumes COVID carries on at levels of the last two years uh, forever more. So a, a lot, a lot in this, but but still, given the yeah, the the quantity of these statistics to see that uh, appear so quickly, I, I I think is really interesting. And Another I think thing, the you, element of that, Michael, the element of that is because it's it, it's hitting the older people. I mean, that's the problem. It's it, COVID is a disease yeah. of the age, basically. And when you now, hear that, when people say uh, it's got with underlying complications, invariably it's dementia and obesity. Yeah, and then we then we'll move on to long COVID in a minute. But uh, returning to this, John Hicks is there, Simon. Uh, for the UK, you have population predictions for the next decade plus, up to perhaps 78 million. What happens if the population remains largely static? Uh, what do you forecast locally? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it depends where the, uh, the, po the population is coming from. Population growth is likely to come from migration. So if it comes from migration, actually, that's probably a good thing. Because generally speaking, people who are migrating across economically active, 
so that they actually contribute and uh, your your your, eco your economy grows and therefore you can afford to have the, the greater spend that you'll need on housing and on hospitals particularly. And one phenomenon actually that is happening with the as people age, which is not new, but it's actually shown quite starkly, is that people move from the urban to the rural. So you see parts of the country that actually suddenly have a completely different need. You're going to find more and much greater need for hospitals and uh, social care in the rural countryside than you are in the city. And that actually is something that we haven't done and haven't seen before, or certainly we haven't seen the quantity that is expected. So that will be a, that will be a great change. But actually, um, if it is, if migration turns out to be the, the, main, the main driver of growth, which it is, probably that's a good thing for this country. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the things that I, I find intriguing as well is you've done such a great amount of work um, on, on backing this up and trying to dig in. And one, of the, one of the interesting ones, of course, is the importance of smoking to these numbers. And in the UK, I, I think from memory, something like uh, the number of cigarettes smoked dropped over the last 20 years from something like 60 billion sticks to about 25 billion sticks per annum. An interesting number. So we, we see that. Um, but let me move on to softer things. So Hugh Purser is curious, you know, you didn't mention religion. Uh, does this have an impact on demographics? I can't see where it does. So, uh, and what is it, perhaps you could expand a bit more, what, is it, what aspect of religion does he mean? Uh, well, I, I, I have, have to type that in, I know. <laughs> but it's, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by religion per se. I mean, you mean, if you mean self-belief or belief in something, Pro so probably with be... regard, to, probably with regard to birth control, I suspect. I remember oh. I once had a, I once had a black dress index, which was you know countries with, uh, you know out in the countryside where women wore black well, dresses. Europe tended to be Catholic and have high birth rates. Uh, well, it's certainly, uh, yeah, it's, it, that's certainly that is certainly true. If you mean it in that in that respect, you've got quite right. It's interesting. The Philippines, which is another country that we have an office in and we are doing work in and we know quite well. Hence, we've used it as a few examples. Um, they know that they have a major economic problem, and that, but the Catholic Church is 98% of people are Catholic, so it's kind of tricky. They are trying to preach birth control, and they are trying to do it in a way that does not offend the religious teaching. So they are slowly making progress, but for them, that is actually a very real handicap. Actually, the, the teaching of the church is very powerful and their birth rate is running far higher than they would like or desire. So that's a good point. It, it's certainly having a, a, the opposite effect from a sensible economic planning. Yeah, well, you know, I remember Ireland was high on my black dress index 40 years ago. And, uh, and yet, uh, as I understand it, you know, religion has weakened enormously there. Birth rate has been falling and they have now effectively joined Northern Europe, looking at a, basically about eight years from now, uh, a, a precipitous fall. Uh, again, in, in their ratios. Um, now, we just have a, an interesting point here, uh, following on to some degree from that, um, and it comes from so I'm just, to, just trying to read a, a lot of these here. Um, yeah, uh, this is Ernie Stelzner. Uh, is it not true that countries that empower their women uh, to be more successful have a drop in their birth rates as women have more, more control over their bodies? Yeah, correct. He's absolutely correct. I mean, educate, that's absolutely correct. And that is, uh, that's why you're seeing. Uh, some of the some of the drops and some of the changes yeah, in the countries I was looking at, but it's spot on, correct. And Ernie also here, do you, do you think that people in the future will not be migrating as much because technology will allow people to work from abroad to fill the job gaps? <laughs> I think that way too early, I'd say, for that actually. It's an interesting debate about, you know, have we, how far have we really changed? How far has COVID really changed us? You know, we all say, I think this is the new normal. There's a, there's a, certainly in the UK, there seems to be a consensus now, two days a week, two and a half, three days a week working in the office. Um, but already you start reading JP Morgan have sort of changed one way. They've gone back from five days in the office to now no days in the office. But have people really changed? I was speaking to some guys in the, uh, in the property area, and they say that, you know, prime space still in the city of London. In fact, Michael, you may know this. Prime space in the city of London is still in great demand. Um, certainly have some of the more grotty secondary spaces is looking sort of so great. But 
there's still a huge demand that does that is way over what you might have expected for the new normal that would say property should demand should drop by 30 to 40 percent because people are now not coming into their offices at anything like the amount so office sharing so i wonder and i think i think the jury is too soon for us to to see that um i think it's a good idea in theory but it's too early to see whether it has a real effect mm -hmm. um just a, a question for me really uh, one of the interesting things in, in your presentation was that the US was number one on longevity of, of the ones that you'd selected back in 1960 and today lies fifth which, you know is there now I, I know I think it's Abraham Lincoln who said in the end it's not the years in your life that count it's the life in your years uh, but what's that got to do for things like you know self-perception of, of rankings and quality of life well the US I mean there are two, okay there are two points the US has fallen behind. Others have grown more quickly. So you've got, you've got the growth of Singapore particularly um, and, and Japan, and they've done lots of things. And you've got the US with, with huge obesity, opioids and guns. There are your three key reasons that the US uh, life expectancy has, has fallen. And, the, and it's very interesting to see that with economic affluence, you get two factors. One, a reduction in female uh, fertility and two the other side of affluence is obesity which effectively reduces the longevity or doesn't increase it as long so mm. the it's uh, the uk the us as a leader got all those things in spades if you just think about the us you know you, you associate them with cars walking you know is not something that you you see there but opioids and guns i mean it's a astounding number of people Thirty thousand people every year die from guns uh, and 120,000 now for opioids. And, and then these are actually usually younger people too. So you're, you're cutting off uh, people in their prime um, And then the obesity, those are the three reasons the US has, has gone backwards whilst the others have surged on. Mm -hmm. Now we, we have a number of interesting questions. Uh, Steve Wells would like to uh, look a little bit more at the challenging perception, the uh, projections of disruptive results earning on uh, technology. Graham Elliott has a wonderful comment on what effect might arise in future generations from improved hygiene and medical care, causing less winnowing of genetic weakness and thus arguably making a, a future population less resistant to disease. So we could go on a while, but in the last two minutes, I'd just like to uh, narrow in. Your theme today uh, was that money needs to last longer. Uh, and I find that you know absolutely fascinating. Um, not least is a lovely quote from uh, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, back uh, in his book, The Age of Uncertainty in 77, he said, money is a singular thing. It ranks with love as man's greatest source of joy and with death as his greatest source of anxiety. Uh, you know, and John Hicks is you know, wondering if you should you know, make this really a STEM module, you know, top tips, please, for education. But where I'm going to come at is uh, possibly a little bit negative. I mean, our industry, financial services, has been extremely poor at long-term advice. Long-term advice being, you know, as little as uh, three, three or four years. Uh, you know, we've been terrible at advising on pensions, uh, long-term products, uh, things like, you know, precipice bonds and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, endowment mortgages. So we have been very good, and we still have debates on fundamentals like what is the discount rate to apply. Uh, in various situations, including you know, long-term issues like climate change. Do you think the profession is critical and hard enough on itself about what it needs to do to provide that advice that you quite rightly said is going to be so essential? Well, I think you make some very fair points there. Those are, those are you, you've alluded to some very public and shameful experiences over the last 30 years or so, mis-selling particular. I mean, you're probably right that the, the profession needs to look uh, at itself a bit more carefully. I mean, the green agenda, I think we've seen a dramatic shift in the last year or so as people have started to wake up and start to realize some of the implications of what we're going to do. But broadly, what the, the whole point uh, of what the financial sector should be doing is encouraging people to think longer, to budget, to start some savings at a reasonable, safe element. And I keep saying this frequently and often, you know, this is not about get rich quick. People need to understand that investment is for the longer term. Uh, and it is modest growth that you should be 
expecting a, sort of around the market rate, five, ten percent. What the problem is that investment people think let's buy a single stock, uh, and the number of countries I go to where the number one question is after giving this is tell me what stocks I should buy. You know, this is the this is where what financial services should be about is getting people to behave logically, measured investment over a long period. Uh, I accept lots of things have gone wrong, um, but actually even so. It has a lot more it could do to help people last, make their money last a lot longer. Well, that's a wonderful place on, on which to close. Um, I've got three quick rounds of thanks, if I can. Uh, firstly, to our sponsors, who you can see before us here. Uh, thanks to all of you for letting us range so widely and freely across these various subjects. And we were delighted to have uh, such an expert as Simon uh, share with us what is effectively, let's be honest, a pet project too, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, you're yeah. consumed with it and it came across. Uh, I'd secondly like to thank the audience. As I say, it's a bit longer than usual, but I think it deserved it of longevity, of course. Uh, and I think what Simon has proved, and my thanks to you, Simon, is very much, it, you know, a lot of people would say demography is destiny, and it certainly will be if you don't look at it. But if we do look at it and examine it with the thoroughness that you're doing, hopefully we can, we can adjust to it and live more fruitful and positive lives together because i think that's what we all want to do and i really really appreciate you spending your time here so with that folks i think we're going to come to a close as ever uh, check out the website for events forthcoming uh, some interesting stuff on china uh, next week and the metaverse and insurance so a lot coming up and we look forward to seeing you at many of these broadcasts in the future uh, thank you very very much thank you bye-bye